So I'm going to be reading chapter 19 on page 102, but before I did, I wanted to explain that this book, Sing Down the Moon, is actually um, a historical fiction book, and the reason why is because there is some truth to what um, happened. The story is made up around it, um, although it's very realistic. Um, the Long Walk really did happen, where the Navajos marched out of um, their homeland. So it said in... There's this little piece that says, in 1860s, the Americans of European descent began settling in and around Navajo lands, leading to conflict between Navajo people on one side and settlers on the U.S. Army on the other. In response to the fighting, the Army created a plan to move all Navajo from their homeland. The forced removal of the Navajo, which began in January of 1864 and lasted two months, came to be known as the Long Walk. According to historic accounts, more than 8,500 men, women, and children were forced to leave their homes in northeastern Arizona and northwestern New Mexico. In the dead of winter, they made the 300-plus mile trek to desolate, intermittent camps along the Picos River in eastern New Mexico called Bosque Redondo Reservation, where the military maintained an outpost, Fort Sumner. Along the way, approximately 200 Navajo died of starvation and exposure to the elements. Four years later, having endured overcrowded and miserable conditions at Bosque Redondo, the Navajo signed the historic U.S. Navajo Treaty of 1868. The treaty allowed the Navajo to return to only a small portion of their original homeland in Arizona and New Mexico. The U.S. government promised basic services in exchange for peace, and the Navajo began the long walk on June 18th, 1868. So just a little bit of historical reference there for you to understand the book a little bit better. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start reading on page 102. The gray flat land between the banks of the river was divided among the clans. Everyone shared alike and each family built some sort of shelter, a cave in the earth, a brush lean-to, or a hut of whatever things could be gathered. Our hunt was made of driftwood we found along the river in strips of old canvas. It kept out the sun, but not the winds, and it was hard to walk around in without bumping your head on something. Food was soon gone, so the long knives passed out parcels of flour to all the families. There were few among us who did not get sick, for the flour was made of wheat, which we were not used to eating, and the water from the muddy river was bitter. There were several hundred Indians already living at Bosque Redondo. They were Apache who had been driven out of their country and were being held prisoners by the Long Knives. The Apache are smaller than we are, but thick and very strong. They are also quarrelsome. They want their way about everything, and if they do not get it, they fight. They fought with us as soon as we came, saying that the land belonged to them and that we were stealing it. My father and two other headmen from the clans told them, that the Navajo did not like Bosque Redondo. If the Apache wanted it, they could have it. All we wanted to live on it uh, until the Long Knives found us a better place. These words did not please the Apache, and they tried to hunt us wherever they could. When every family had shelter and food, the Long Knives sent all the men who were able to work with a hoe to spread or to break up the earth and plant it with corn and with wheat, which we did not like. Then they set them to digging ditches to carry water from the river into the fields. Thus summer began at Bosque Redondo, our new home. My mother and sister and I, like all the other women, had little to do. There was no corn to grind. Wagons came filled with flour. White soldiers stood in it up to their knees and passed it out to us on big wooden shovels. There were no sheep to tend or wool to shear and weave into blankets. There were no hunters to bring in hides to scrape and stretch and make into leggings. We were idle most of the time. It was the same with Tallboy. He would come over every morning after breakfast and sit around in front of our hut until the sun was well up. Then he would wander down the river and lie in the sun some more. He liked to show the other young Navajo the big white scar on his shoulder where the Spaniard's bullet had struck him. Only he told them it was one of the long knives who had given him the scar. The other men, who were also idle most of the time, once the fields were planted and the water ditches dug, like Tallboy, they enjoyed talking about the days before they came to Bosque Redondo. They sat around and bragged about things they had done. They made threats against the long knives, but the threats were weak and spoken quietly. They gossiped worse than women. The heart 
had gone out of them. The spirit had left their bodies. It was a bad summer in Belscordondo. There were ghosts and witches everywhere, and many people sickened and died. Then the first crop failed. There was little rain, and our men had trouble leading water up from the river. Some of the fields were planted again, but winds blew the seeds away, and fall came without a harvest. There was much talk about that, about the long knives who lived in the gray walled fort in the midst of our fields. Hardly a day went by that some new story did not spread from hut to hut about them. The wheat flour would run out before winter came. The flour was cursed, and if we went on eating it, we would all die. The long knives wanted us to die, and so we would, in some way or another. One story came to use from three different men who had been in a place fifteen days' journey to the north. Each man brought the same story, so it was surely true. The place was called excuse me, Sand Creek, and it was near a town which was in the mountains. They said that a village of Cheyenne and Arapaho were asleep in their lodges. There was a white preacher... And he rode out from the town with some men, and when they came to the sleeping village, he gave an order, kill and scalp all Indians, big and little, he shouted, since nits make lice. Without warning, every Indian was killed. Afterward, scalps were taken and shown to the people in the town. This story was told many times, and everyone feared that the same thing would happen to us. The long knives would steal out from their fort and kill us all while we slept, yet our men did nothing. They sat and shook their heads, but made no plans to defend themselves or their families should the long knives come. Even Tallboy did nothing but talk about the soldiers and how they wanted to see us die. One day I asked him, What are you going to do if the long knives fall upon us in the night? Will you cover your head and wait to be slain? He looked at me and bit his lip. The gods will tell us what to do, he said. Now they punish us. When the time comes, they will speak and we will hear them. My father talked this way too, and many of the other men at Bosquardondo when summer was ending. You can tell bright morning, she's just so full of um, spirit, and she doesn't want to give up, and I just love this about her character. Um, when you guys are done, there is a crossword puzzle on your learning journal on page 24. Now, if you don't have a stylus, it's going to be quite hard to do. This is something new I wanted to try. Your best bet may be to write your answers, um, all like all your answers across and the numbers and then down and then insert the page, a picture. Um, you can type in your answers. Um, it's kind of up to you whatever way you think is the easiest to uh, complete that vocabulary crossword puzzle. On Learning Journal page 25, you are to write a one paragraph reflection piece on how you think Bright Morning was feeling about her new home at Bosque Redondo. Um, and be sure to add the text evidence. Um, maybe you can add like what page something was set on um, and so on. So uh, good luck with this. And we are almost done. Two more um, sections of the book that I'll kind of close up with. So um, see you soon.